All right, good uh, morning, good day, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Christian, and I am a proud member of the Shortland Scholars Admissions Team, and it's an honor to spend the next hour with you in conversation. Um, our webinar today is going to center a different angle of the folks who are applying to the program and those who have experienced the program themselves directly. Uh, and when we started to think about uh, what was important for us to, to spotlight, it was really important to clear the way for leaders who maybe not have had any experience engaging with China because as part of the ecosystem, we might have scholars who have had significant time studying Mandarin or uh, spending some time working in or near Asia. But it's really important to start to center some dialogue around those people who might have seen Schwarzman scholars as an entry point into learning uh, more about the network, about the skills necessary to collaborate with China. And so that's what we're excited about spotlighting in this uh, career development spotlight, uh, the why China stories about those different experiences that are there. So as you are coming into the room, again, please continue to fill out the poll. It's exciting. We'll share the results in just a bit. Uh, but I first wanted to say that we have a lot of great content at shoresandscholars.org. So don't worry about uh, learning the, the, the nuts and bolts of the program because we have lots of content out there where you can participate in general webinars that gives you a quick overview of the program. Um, the recording of this presentation, as well as some of our other Spotlight series are made available on our YouTube channel. So we encourage you to take a look at some of those uh, previous recordings of ways in which we spotlight student life, uh, when we look at the alumni network, et cetera. Uh, and then of course, uh, our conversation of what happens uh, to scholars after they complete the program. And so again, we want to reiterate that um, we are neutral on China experience. And so it's not necessarily uh, a driving factor for selection in the admissions office, uh, but it is an important factor to consider in one sense of self and, and in articulating their narrative and their motivations to why this program. Uh, so aside from our, our, over, our, our welcome, uh, we'll provide uh, a little bit of the career development overview where I'll invite my colleague, uh, Julia Zupko to do a, a little bit of introduction and profiling of our, our program. Then we'll launch into a moderated scho scholar panel and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So a few reminders that if you have any particular questions in order to join the conversation, you have to join uh, via typing your questions in the Zoom Q&A module. Uh, so that's the only way that the chat otherwise is, is, um, uh, is disabled. So please ask your questions via the chat. And during the presentation, I'll be consolidating those into question themes that we can uh, hand over to our Rockstar panelists. Uh, and so I want to start off by grounding ourselves in the mission of what we are. So Shores and Scholars, uh, our, our grounding mission is uh, preparing leaders to serve in a world where China plays a key role. And what you see on the screen here is a, a plethora and a, a buffet, if you will, of all the different ways in which we uh, try to have our young people, our, our, our scholars, to think about their leadership, how do they collaborate with others. And so we do so both in the classroom through a master's degree in global affairs, as well as uh, things outside of the classroom where you engage with mentors, uh, where you uh, engage in internship sites, and you take uh, study tours that give you new reference points uh, of the country. So that is what the program is in a nutshell. It's an 11 month experience at Tsinghua University, uh, but it's a whole lot more. And so what we'll hear from in just a bit are the uh, are the stories of some of the people who uh, a lot of these uh, pieces of the program were, were brand new, uh, whether it be their study of Mandarin, whether it be uh, getting a sense of what the country is um, based on, on um, contrasting what they thought they knew about China to what it actually was. So uh, we're really excited to um, to put their, their, their experiences on display. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to close the poll. Uh, and I'll share the results with you because I think this is a good, interesting subset of what we've got uh, in the room today. Uh, so we've got a range of both undergraduate, graduates, and young professionals, which is fantastic. Uh, we see a lot of international representation in terms of where people are based uh, and where they're viewing from. Uh, we can see from the poll of our set uh, of our data set today that about half, uh, well, 43% have traveled to uh, China, Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan uh, versus 57% uh, who haven't. Uh, a majority of the poll has not studied Mandarin. I think you'll really like a, a bit of the conversation and the theme today on that note. Uh, and then we also have a majority of the poll who will uh, just now newly embark on their professional experiences. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing those results and then I'll call to the uh, floor. Uh, Julia Zupko, my colleague who works in career development. So thank you so much, Julia. Take it away. Thanks so much, Christian. Welcome, everyone. 
I oversee career and professional development at Schwarzenegger College, and I'm excited to have a conversation with you today and a number of our panelists who, much like you, represent a variety of geographic locations, disciplines, years of work experience. Um, and so I think we'll have a robust conversation about what their kind of experience in coming to China was like. You should know when we look at the most uh, recent admitted class, interestingly enough, our, in our most recently admitted class, 50% of the incoming class has never taken Mandarin ever before. So uh, given the fact that 64% uh, of those on the webinar today also have not uh, taken any Mandarin, uh, you're in good stead if you come to the college. Um, we, again, are neutral on China and, and really welcome everyone whether they have had experience or um, are looking to gain that experience as part of their overall uh, narrative uh, for their professional development. Similarly, in our incoming uh, class, only 40% or 40% or have never been to China. Um, and so that's uh, again, really similar to, to the profile in our webinar today. So we're excited uh, to talk more about that. People often ask, what do people do after the program from a career development perspective? Um, we are a highly diverse uh, student body whereby we have some folks coming straight from undergrad and of course some uh, young professionals who have five years of work experience. So what we see is about 15% go on to further graduate school, law school, medical school, um, uh, other graduate school, MBA, uh, public policy, about 10% go on to other career endeavors. So some of these are military commitments, starting their own businesses, um, and, and things of that nature, um, or personal pursuits. We have some, we've had some composers in the class, um, we've had some journalists, things like that. And then about 75% take what I would term traditional employment, although traditional for us can mean everything from uh, working, uh, you know, on cross-border uh, situations in the humanitarian space um, to more traditional roles in something like consulting uh, all over the world. Uh, so high variety there. About uh, five to seven percent of non-Chinese citizens in the program stay in China for employment. Um, so again, some always do, but uh, it's definitely not the majority. I look forward to uh, having this conversation with you and we're gonna leave plenty of time for questions and answers, but I'm actually gonna open it up to our panel now if our panelists can turn on their cameras. And again, you're gonna get to hear um, from folks on our panel who came to Shores with Scholars without work experience, some who came with work experience, and again, from regions all around the world, as well as different uh, personal interests professionally. So I'm gonna start with Harnad. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I'd love to have you give us your, uh, your personal reaction when you first heard about a scholarship that was going to take place in China. Um, what, what was your immediate reaction when you heard, first heard about that? I'd, I'd like to say that, oh, it was an automatic fit in my head, but I didn't really think of China. You know, it's a neighboring country. That's about it. It wasn't something that existed in the periphery of my consciousness um, as an Indian citizen, more than the fact that we do have border tensions with China and that manufacturing happens in China. And uh, when I heard about the scholarship, it took me a while to actually understand where it fit into my own narrative and my own career aspirations. Why did I want to come to China? Why did I want to do Schwarzman Dai specifically? And um, which is why my application went in about 12 hours before the deadline wrapped up because I just didn't know whether I wanted to apply or not because China felt like a huge variable I didn't understand. Uh, but I'm so glad I did. And China has suddenly become a huge part of my life for Schwarzman. And I'm so glad it did because um, it's added so much value to what I bring to the table personally as well as professionally. Well, I, I know that uh, the program has added a lot of value to your development, but I'd love, I know that you added a lot of value to the community as well. Maybe you can give me an example of, of maybe when your experience and perspective um, maybe added a unique viewpoint um, on an issue or helped other people in the program grow in their understanding. Um, while we were 
in China a little before we had to leave due to the COVID-19 situation. The Citizenship Amendment Act um, reforms uh, were going to be passed through the Indian Parliament, which led to protests and eventually uh, anti-Muslim riots in uh, New Delhi. Um, we were, of course, in China. We couldn't help on ground. We, we could barely even get news on time. And uh, what we decided to do as a as the Indian scholars instead was educate the folks around us about what the citizenship concerns of India are and why the bill is unconstitutional. And we got to have a conversation on, so, so a huge part of the program is heavily America and China focused. Uh, we are the rest of the world, which has caused a fair amount of friction earlier on too, because it feels slightly underrepresented. And um, having those conversations helped a lot in building that representation and building that international consciousness within the rest of the scholars. Um, and it strengthened us as a community because we could talk about what's happening back home and actually be acknowledged and understood. And I'm so glad that has continued with the scholars after us too. The current cohort is raising money for COVID-19 relief in India and Brazil. Uh, we've had difficult conversations during steep streets and even in personal capacity. And being able to do that, I think, was a great value add that any international scholar can add to the conversations happening in college. Thanks, Harnad. I think you've really hit on a key point of the fact that at Schwarzman College, our scholars live, dine, and study together every day. And the opportunities that provides, whether it be on an elevator ride, sitting down for breakfast, or uh, just you know having a conversation immediately after class or sharing these insights um, and really learning from one another is, is so incredibly important. Daniel, I'd love to, to, to switch over um, to maybe your story. Prior to joining Schwarzman Scholars, you actually had some work experience. You were a consultant, um, but you, you shared with me that you know, you had followed international affairs and, you know, believed that China would be, you know, important in, in the long term. Um, but what surprised you when you started to look into the Schwarzman Scholars Program as compared to what your understanding was of it initially? Certainly. I think my, my knee-jerk reaction, to be, to be candid with you, when I first heard about the program, uh, is that this must be something to train the next generation of China hands, of, of China specialists. Uh, a year-long immersive program in Beijing at Tsinghua uh, sounded very much like it, it would be a natural fit, primarily for people who had a deep, deep background uh, in studying Chinese language, in uh, having aspirations to live and work in China, who kind of had uh, a China thread sort of woven into their backgrounds already. And, and in fact, the two good friends I, I knew from my undergraduate days who had gone through the program before me, uh, both had studied Mandarin in, in school and very much kind of uh, represented that, that, that sort of image of a, of a China buff or, or a China hand. Um, as, as I learned more about the program, I, I very quickly kind of came to appreciate that that is not at all the, the, the only target profile or even the main profile that, that the program goes after. And so uh, I think the way Christian framed it at the onset of this presentation is, is quite right. You know, the program is looking for people uh, who, who are sort of engaged, interested, have an ambition to, to do something meaningful uh, with their lives or, or in the world, um, and to connect that with an interest in China. You know, that, that people across all sorts of different disciplines with all sorts of different aspirations uh, in life somehow have, have an understanding of, have an appreciation for uh, the issues that, that sort of determine uh, China's relations with, with the rest of the world and, and, and see China becoming an important factor, an important uh, player on, on the international scene, again, across all spheres, I think, of, of, of human endeavor. Um, and so connected to that, I, I also, I think, came, came to appreciate that the program uh, wasn't just looking for, for China specialists, uh, but also wasn't just looking for one particular uh, kind of mold or type of interest that, that people had. And so, uh, as, as, as you mentioned, Julia, I had uh, previous work experience in the private sector as a management consultant. When I applied to, to the program as an undergraduate, I'd studied economics and history, have always been very much fascinated by, by questions of diplomacy and, and foreign policy. And 
in my life, I, I hope to sort of combine those those interests or, or to pursue both of them, perhaps not in parallel, but but in some uh, guise or way or shape or form. And so uh, Schwartzman scholar is not only accommodating of that, but but encourages that. And, and so um, we had people in my year with all sorts of interests, you know, ranging from being interested in, in startups and wanting to make a career in technology uh, to budding academics to uh, aspiring diplomats or civil servants. I mean, the, the entire gambit. And, and I think in part because Steve Schwartzman, kind of the, <laughs> the namesake of the program himself uh, made his career in, in the private sector as, as an investor, uh, there is an appreciation for sort of a diversity of, of different professional pursuits that, that are important uh, for society and for the world. And so drawing from those different academic and, and kind of professional interests is something that, that really resonated for me as well. Yeah, we're ne neutral on China, but we're also neutral on whatever it is you want to pursue and what those interests are. And, and I think when you think about kind of applying to Schwarzman scholars, right, it's about telling your story and in, in how, uh, China ultimately fits into that. And we talked about um, with Harnad the, the diversity of the geographic representation of the class and, and what you're saying, Daniel, also the, ge the diversity of, of the interests really add that special element and perspective. Um, one of the things that you, know, you and I've talked about in the past too is this idea that going to China is so much different than just reading something in a newspaper or a book. Um, Maybe you could share, is there a particularly meaningful experience that you had um, that you wouldn't have gleaned from just, you know, reading about China? Oh, sure. So, so one, I mean, you know, the question is more, how long do you have uh, uh, rather than, you know, how much I can tell you. But what, one example that, that or vignette that comes to mind quite, quite readily is um, as, as part of my time in Beijing, I, I had the opportunity to, to accompany a U.S. congressional delegation uh, that was that was visiting China. I was was passing through Beijing, and essentially, uh, we we got to ha hang out for an afternoon with uh, a bipartisan group of, of U.S. lawmakers who had just come from meetings with um, the Chinese government and, and and various Chinese officials. And and so, getting uh, very much a kind of fly on the wall sort of inside view of, of how diplomacy happens in, in, in real time and, and the different concerns that you know, these lawmakers from Republican and Democratic constituencies in the US, uh, the, the assumptions that they brought about China to this trip, how they were kind of reacting to uh, what they were seeing, the meetings that they had had, uh, what that augurs for, for the future of, of US-China relations uh, was was fascinating, truly. I mean, I mean, uh, and and sort of immersive, in a way that reading about either the practice of diplomacy or reading a newspaper article, you know, from from ten thousand miles away, uh, never would have been. Great, thank you for sharing that story. Um, I'm going to move over to Stefan and and have you, by contrast, you know. You've shared with me that the Schwarz with Scholars program was actually particularly interesting to you because of its geographical contrast to the very, you know, Western-centric undergrad education that you had received. Um, maybe you can share a little bit more about why, being from Europe, it was important for you to learn more about China. Uh, sure. Thank you, Julia. Um, so I'm from Austria, but I, I, I studied from undergrad in the United Kingdom. And also appreciate the uh, education, the perspectives I've received. I often considered them to be um, very monoclausal in, in certain regards. So like Daniel, I studied politics, economics, uh, and also history. Um, and one aspect that initially strongly attracted me to the program uh, was this embedded understanding of focusing on global affairs, but also doing so from a nuanced China-focused perspective to not um, to focus on the changing order of global affairs, but also allow for a more holistic analysis whilst having entrenched China focus. Um, so that was the first aspect um, that I think was really important for me when I thought about applying through, um, uh, in the program. And then uh, throughout my program experience, what, I've, what I would also highlight 
is that you have this opportunity to really pursue different pathways. So for example, for me, um, I'm from Europe. I'm very interested in developing relationships between Europe and China further beyond the simple trade in goods, which is advanced, but towards cooperation, say in science and um, investment, uh, but also in people to people ties. And one of the highlights of the program so far for me um, has been the capstone, which is the dissertation, uh, we call it capstone, uh, that every student has to write. Uh, where, I ha where I had the opportunity to work with a group of other scholars and a partner organization, in this case, uh, the World Economic Forum, on looking at um, developing deeper ties between cities. And that has allowed me to both uh, entrench and develop a, strong, a more nuanced understanding of China's role in global affairs, but also uh, leverage my own background and also provide, uh, uh, discover new perspectives to issues that I'd perhaps consider from a different angle previously. Great. And maybe you can share as a current student kind of the, the fact that you were looking for that right post-program opportunity. What did you explore um, and look at? It sounds like you had this amazing capstone project. Um, and ultimately, what have you decided to, to pursue? And does China kind of play a part in that? Yeah, so for me, um, I was I was definitely down the more conventional path that you outlined before that I uh, I, I was looking for more conventional roles, uh, particularly in the private sector. Um, and I ended up deciding to go for a role uh, that is very focused on technology, so focused on 5G and is located in Europe, but because of the issue of 5G, of course, has strong connections to China. Um, and I was in the very fortunate decision uh, position that I uh, I could have chose um, whether I wanted to stay in Europe or also move to China on a permanent basis. Um, and that was a very difficult decision for me to make personally, um, but definitely the opportunity to go to China would have, for me, uh, certainly not opened up without the program. And also the program I took experience uh, provided me a much more nuanced perspective uh, of the path that I want to go down. So even though I'm staying in Europe, I do feel like I've gained definitely new perspectives, but also new knowledge that I hope to apply uh, in my future career. And thank you so much. Um, I want everyone in our audience to start getting their questions ready because after Adea shares her story, we're going to really open it up and make sure that we um, get your questions answered. But Adea, um, you know, totally uh, different areas of interest for you. And so I'm excited to, to have you share your perspective, um, especially one where I think you know someone mentioned to you that you should consider source and scholars uh, and, and, and you kind of brushed them off and said, I don't know about that. I don't know if that's for me. Um, and, and whether that narrative again, uh, similar to Harnid, get, you know, how does this narrative fit into, into my personal interests? Um, uh, especially in, in you know, the public health space and things like that. So maybe you could tell us more about your interests and how you approached the year. Yeah, so um, very dissimilar to everyone else on the call, my interest is in healthcare. Uh, so I wasn't, I wasn't even really in the public policy, um, technology, a lot of those buzzwords that you hear when it comes to China, none of those related to me whatsoever. I knew nothing about AI before I got to China. I knew nothing really about public policy at all. Um, nothing really in the international uh, global affairs spec, uh, sphere. So everything was kind of foreign to me but i think because of that it really i did not speak chinese i had no experience with china outside of the research that i did for my swordsman interview um and so you know i really came into china having zero expectations about what the experience was going to be. And I think that was one of the things that really allowed me to enjoy the experience for what it was. Uh, I think my classmates that came out the most satisfied were the ones that had no expectations about the experience. Uh, because when you set a bar that this experience is gonna be X, Y, and Z, and then it doesn't, it doesn't turn out that way, then you feel like you haven't gotten the experience that you hoped for. But I was really able to go in with zero expectations expectation about what the experience was going to be. And I think for me, that's been able to translate into other areas of my life as well. Um, a lot of the more interesting experiences that I've had have been the ones that I didn't plan for. Um, like a lot of people who apply for programs like these, uh, I, I tend to be one of those people who wants to curate all of my life experiences and like these are the boxes that you have to check and this is the way that this experience is supposed to to unfold and Schwartzman really allowed me to kind of shift my perspective and just 
let the experiences happen as they happen and to embrace the opportunities as they were presented. Uh, and I think those were some of the highlights of my Schwartzman experience, but have also kind of been guiding principles since leaving the program as well. That's great. I think uh, a lot of that, that sense of curiosity, right, and that willingness to take advantage of what those opportunities may be as, as they come along. Again, whether it's that conversation uh, over lunch or whether it's a, a further opportunity to even engage across China. Um, Adea, I know you had the opportunity to, to travel a little bit while you were in China um, and even do, I think, a homestay experience. Maybe you could share a little bit more about some of something that you specifically took advantage of while you were there. Yeah, so I joke with people all the time now that I've probably seen more of China than I have the United States uh, because we, uh, I mean, a lot of people in our cohort, right? But we really took advantage of having the opportunity to be able to explore China, the different regions of China. I did a lot of things that really scared my parents because I was doing a lot of them by myself. <laughs> um, but one of, one of those kind of highlight experiences was my homestay, I went to rural China. Um, so I was in um, Shaanxi province and I, Tsinghua has a program that allows Tsinghua or Chinese national students who go to Tsinghua to sign up to take foreigners home with them for Chinese New Year. And so apparently, I don't remember doing this, but apparently in my interview for said program, I really emphasized that I wanted to spend some time in rural China. Um, and so I uh, was placed with a family in Zhang'an County in, um, and I, Getting, getting train tickets during Chinese New Year is a whole different story, but um, I took a train down. Uh, it was about an eight hour train ride on the high speed train. So, so not a short ride by any stretch of the imagination. And I got to spend a week in a city that um, most of the people that I encountered had never met a foreigner at all. Um, Add, add on that kind of the, the ethnic demographic as well. Uh, and, and that was definitely an interesting conversation piece for most people that week. Uh, but my Chinese, the Chinese New Year falls about halfway through the academic year. And so my Chinese was improving, but it was not good by any stretch of the imagination. And so um, having to kind of balance those communication barriers. There was only one person in the family that I was living with that spoke any English. Um, her English was definitely better than my Chinese, but um, that was an interesting kind of conversation of us having to um, communicate across those barriers, um, having to kind of learn the cultural significance of Chinese New Year. I had never really self or really knew much of anything about Chinese New Year kind of outside of dragon lanterns, kind of the things that you see in the United States that are super stereotypical. And so really being able to kind of learn, but also learn through immersion of, of Chinese New Year and the holiday, the significance, uh, and also just really feeling welcomed by the family that I was, I was living with. It was quite a large extended family. And so we got to do a lot of really interesting activities. Um, and even, even now I have conversations about that experience probably once a week <laughs> uh, of just being able to kind of talk about how I was able to take that journey, um, knowing basically no Chinese in the grand scheme of, of the Chinese language, um, but still taking away so much from the opportunity um, and really uh, feeling so welcomed and so involved in this family who didn't have to take me in um, and also having an experience that was just so dissimilar to some of the other cities that I had visited in China um, because for the most part, the places that we were visiting were places um, that are geared towards tourism um, or at least have some, some semblance of, of tourism that, that kind of is weaved through the fabric of the cities that we're visiting. And this was not that. This was just people living their day-to-day -day lives um, and, and really still wanting to involve me in the activities of something that for them was so sacred. Thank you so much. I think at the heart of all of your stories, right, is this uh, concept of relationships um, in, in the different ways that those have evolved uh, uh, over the course of the year. I know that um, Christian's been keeping an eye for me on that 
uh, chat and the Q&A. Um, so what, what are some of the things that people are interested in learning more about, Christian? Sure. So I think um, what we're seeing as a recurring theme is since you had no China experience, what do you think are some of the major contributions? And uh, we can do round robin or you can call on whoever uh, to share because you were new to China. So seeing the eyes, through, seeing through the eyes of people who didn't study Mandarin, never been to China before, what do you think was your value add as someone who didn't have those backgrounds? Yeah. So, um, you know, really thinking about what did you, what did you bring? Um, and and Harnid, you touched on that first, so maybe I'll turn it over. Um, Stefan, can you talk maybe and kick us off on this one about what you feel like you kind of brought to the program with your perspective? Yeah, so Harnid mentioned this uh, early on in the introduction, but I think there's, of course, a strong US and China presence on the program. Um, and particularly for scholars coming from different countries, it's also insightful and a great opportunity to share their perspectives and their background and thus contribute to the diversity of opinions and to the diversity of thought on campus. And one thing that I've definitely experienced is that uh, everyone in, in, Schwarzman, in Schwarzman College, uh, from the academic staff to the scholars, have been very open and receptive towards exchanging views and learning from different perspectives. Um, and so that open environment to not only present different views, but also listen and try to learn from each other has been very enriching. And, also a, a very rewarding experience because of this diverse cohort. Uh, there are so many more stories um, and perspectives to learn from. Great. Anyone else need, want to chime in on that one? Okay. Sure, so I'll jump in on the next question, which is actually re uh, related to how did you then thread uh, your newness to China into your application, whether it be the essays, whether it be um, uh, your video. So the, uh, we'd like to talk a little bit more about how did you thread your non-China experience into uh, the Shores and Scholars application process? Harnid, Adea, maybe I'll have you guys take this one where, where both of you kind of really, I think it sounds like thought deep and hard about whether or not this was the right program for you. And, and once you ultimately made that decision, how did what was your thought process and thinking about how that narrative fit together and then how did you kind of communicate that um, in the process? Um, Harna, do you mind kicking us off on that one? Um, I came from a social impact background. Uh, I worked in philanthropy in India and I had kicked off my own nonprofit organization. Uh, and I realized that it wasn't a place I wanted to be in any longer uh, simply because um, I, I didn't feel like I was making an impact and I wanted to um look at other avenues and one of the things i narrowed down upon was basically the entrepreneurship ecosystem all right before i came to schwarzman i spent about five months in the vc and i realized i enjoyed it a lot and one of the few things i did enjoy immensely was consumer tech and um when i thought of china um i thought of all the opportunities i would have at engaging with the kind of cutting edge consumer tech that china builds and china uh, manages to scale across different geographies and different uh, demographics and i realized that there are so many learnings to take back home specifically because we are trying to build for the next billion users and we use and um technically the next billion users still exist in china <laughs> not in india uh, so um what I ended up thinking in terms of my narrative was that I'm not going to be a China hand. I know that. I don't have the language skills. I don't have the years of experience in China hands that we worked with in uh, Schwarzman did either. But what I can be is a conduit. I can bring together experts on both ends of the table. I can bring together perspectives. I can reach out to a community that I built over my time in China, and I can retrofit it into the work I'm doing today. So I managed to pivot from social impact to currently I'm now working with Swiggy, which is uh, one of the largest food aggregation and delivery platforms in India. And I'm a part of their new initiatives uh, program where I bring in international perspectives on investments and trend setting. So all that emerged from how I understood consumer tech and the consumer communities in China. And uh, that was very, very impactful. That's great. Thank you so much. How about you, Adea? Um, so I think I kind of took a, a opposite approach of, um, I think there may have been one, possibly two paragraphs in my whole application that even mentioned China. <laughs> um, because that 
part of what Julia mentioned earlier, that just wasn't a part of my story. And I think I really took an opportunity to attempt at least, I guess it, it worked, um, to show the admissions committee who I was and what I was interested in. And then I did use, like I said, that paragraph or two to kind of tie in why a year in China would benefit me or why a year specifically as a Schwarzman scholar would benefit what I wanted to do in the world and how I wanted to impact and show up in the world. And so for me, the experience was much less about you become a China expert <laughs> and, and much more about immerse yourself in an experience to um, try to expand, you know, all of the buzzwords, your co cultural competency, your ability to communicate across cultural borders, um, and also just to have really interesting conversations and to learn things. Uh, I think going back to my comments before, I was just really open to the experience and what it had to offer. And I think that was able to come across in my application in a way that said, okay, we can understand how this would be a beneficial experience for you, but also how you would add value to, to the class and, and the things that we do here in the college. So I really didn't focus a lot on China and how I was gonna learn so much about China or how China was gonna play a role in, in my career because the reality is there's very little that I do with related to China on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and even month to month or year to year, there's very little things that I'm doing that relate to China other than having conversations about this awesome year that I spent there. Um, and so really being able to say, this is who I am. And then this is how that experience is going to amplify what it is that I want to do long-term. Great. Terrific, thanks. I got to jump in, uh, and and I think one of the points that you bring up today about being simultaneous culture fit and culture add is such an important part of what we are. Is we are there's oneness in being a Schwarzman scholar, but there's also a, a very deliberate uh, very deliberate diversity within all the different ways, demography, geography, all of the above. And I think there's so much, that's really part of the secret sauce of having a contrast of different lived experiences. Uh, the next question is about surprise. And I'll love to invite Daniel to talk about what surprised you about being there on the ground compared to what you thought you knew about China to what you actually learned and took away from China and the process of learning and unlearning what you know about China. Oh yeah, I mean, many surprises both big and small, I would say, over the course of the year. And, and so those range from uh, <clears throat> kind of the very mundane of uh, what does it feel like to, to, to spend time in sort of the physical environment, right? To, to, to live in a city like Beijing. And so beginning perhaps with, with the very mundane things, one of the concerns that, that I had uh, candidly thinking about living in Beijing for a year was concern around uh, air pollution and, and, and the quality of the air. And, and so, you know, uh, that was something I had to think about and, and whether that would be what would be an issue. And the reality is it, it wasn't an, an issue at all. I mean, of course, uh, in this day and age, we're all accustomed to, to wearing masks. Uh, but even when, when I uh, participated in the program from 2018 to 2019, the problem did not really present itself in, in a significantly inhibiting way. Uh, the college itself has industrial grade air filters. Uh, the air quality in Beijing over the past decade has, has improved quite quite noticeably. And so on the odd days where the air quality was low, you, you knew to, to don a mask and, and you could navigate and it wasn't an issue uh, and it wasn't a problem. And so, you know, beginning maybe with, with those sort of small things, it cascades into into much bigger questions as well, right? The the grand narratives that uh, one perhaps has about a country, a country's politics, its history, uh, its social fabric, all of these things are are kind of enriched and challenged when you actually spend time in the place, travel in the place, uh, and also get to to interact deeply and build relationships with with other people uh, from that place, or who are also experiencing that place with you. From, from abroad. Uh, and so maybe one other just just short uh, example I, I, I would I would give is, you know, today the narrative uh, around the US and China increasingly, I think, emphasizes uh, an adversarial sort of relationship. There, there is conflict, there is tension, and, and there's no 
denying that or dancing around that. But uh, the way that in China and in the US, we, we think about the other country uh, is, is reflected in the historical narratives and the political narratives that, that uh, we are aware of. And so generally, I, I, you know, I was expecting uh, a very sort of, I don't know, somewhat hostile or narrative focused around um, sort of grievances between China and the United States. And, and so on one, one trip that I took to, to Southern China to Kunming, which is the, the capital of Yunnan province in, in uh, the South of China um, with a few other scholars, I, I went to an exhibit uh, in, a, in a local museum on the flying tigers. And, and for those of you who, who aren't familiar with, with the flying tigers, uh, that was a, a, a unit of volunteer uh, American pilots who, who fought alongside China against the Japanese during World War II uh, as, as, a, as a volunteer force. And this, this museum, which was a state-run and sanctioned museum, had, had an incredibly positive uh, kind of representation or depiction of the United States and, and, and talked in glowing terms about the flying tigers and uh, how the United States and China had been uh, standing together in solidarity against uh, fascism or against against the Japanese uh, during the war, and you know that that nugget of 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 a history that is more complex and more rich and of a relationship that's that's also much more varied than the simple narrative of China a rising power kind of colliding with the United States as as the established superpower in the world. Um, is something that that I got by being in China and, and sort of by, for instance, learning about uh, how the flying tigers are remembered and are thought of today. Uh, I think I got a more nuanced picture and, and particularly in, in kind of the, the current political climate, I think it's important that uh, that sort of exchange and that 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 channel for, for understanding and for nuance doesn't doesn't get doesn't get lost. Yeah, no, I think um, complexity is a great way to really talk about all aspects uh, of the program and and uh, the the relationships um, uh, across borders um, in so many different directions. A couple of questions have come in uh, specifically about some specific aspects of the program that I'll touch upon. Um, the first being Stefan mentioned kind of this capstone project. Um, we have two different ways you can approach a capstone uh, during your year in China. You can do a group project that is kind of essentially sponsored or hosted by an external organization like the World Economic Forum as Stefan described, or if you have a very personal interest, I can think of an example where we had a scholar one year who cared deeply about water and water conservation issues, which is a, a hot topic in fast growing cities within China. Um, and, and that person did an individual capstone diving very, very deep on that particular um, story and, and understanding uh, the challenges and potential solutions uh, for that within China um, and, and what could be learned and extended to the rest of the world. Um, internships is, is another way uh, to, to definitely kind of uh, get involved. Uh, no internships are guaranteed during the academic year. We post a lot of internships uh, that are available, everything from, you know, plug and play, which is a large incubator hosts uh, projects in any given year. This year's theme, uh, it was energy. Um, and they had a number of, of fast growing startups that were a part of their portfolio that offered internships to scholars. We post um, a whole variety of options, but scholars also because of their diverse interests seek out opportunities that fit what their interests are. Um, Adea, I think you actually interned at what United Family Hospital. Is that correct? Um, so uh, feel free to share. Do you want to share anything about that experience? Uh, but yeah. that really fits your interests. It did. Um, it's a, uh, I am entering into medical school this next academic year. And so I just spent the last year of my life going through the med school application process. Um, and that was actually one of the really interesting experiences that I, I got to talk about because it kind of did some duality of a international experience, but also some shadowing and clinical experience as well. Um, 
I, one of my mentors at Schwartzman and my, my capstone mentor was Joan Kaufman. And so she was able to connect me to um, Roberta Lipton, who's the CEO and founder of United Family Hospital. Um, and we were able to set up like a really interesting internship where I was there, I think for like eight weeks. And each week I got to go to a different department in the hospital. Um, so I got to watch my first live birth. That was fun. Um, but I also got to do do some like less clinical things and more administrative things as well um, to really get a full look of like how this international hospital was running and functioning in China. And so it was very tailored to my interests, um, but still under that overarching theme of all that China has to offer. So yeah. Great. Um, there are many uh, programs that we offer in orientation around intercultural training on the job search strategy if you are seeking um, employment, but ultimately what Adea just described, this idea that, you know, because of the diversity of the class, um, you do have to kind of take ownership of what it is you're looking for and how you can best take advantage and pursue opportunities um, and explore those. We have a strong mentor program um, that can enable you, again, additional perspective, possible project-based opportunities. Um, but again, lots of, lots of different ways to, to engage over the year. But again, we're looking for people who are um, not gonna sit back and wait, but are going to proactively pursue. Um, I'd love to turn it over um, and, and to our panelists for one last question, and which is to say, you know, part of the China experience is exposing yourself to what that maybe next big thing is, um, or maybe you can also, so you could share something that you learned about what that next big thing might be um, that you, you hadn't really considered, or just what any advice that you might have um, for someone without China experience who might be trying to figure out whether or not this is the right program for them. Um, Harnad, do you mind if I start with you and we'll go around? Sure, um, got to travel to a bunch of cities in China during the program. And one of those times was Shenzhen. I spent 15 days there because I had to do Unleash, which my team won and we had to do the deep dive in the same 15 day period. And um, I was walking down uh, the road of the Tencent office where the, where the Unleash folks were actually doing their um, building. And this guy comes up to me and says, hi, we're testing out a drone for coffee delivery. Can we, you know, get your feedback? And um, this was around the time I had to make a bunch of decisions for what I wanted to do post Schwartzman. You know, I had a few interviews lined up, a few analyst positions had opened up. And I saw that drone come down to the cup of coffee. And I realized that as fun as everything else would be, I really wanted to go into consumer tech. And that was where I wanted to end up. And that was my next exciting moment simply because I saw what the future looks like. You know, you, that's the thing with being in China, especially when you come uh, from a place where you don't know much about China. It's like being able to see this just a few seconds before anyone else. And, so exciting to be able to take those learnings back home and um yeah it's that that was incredible and if you are deciding whether you want to come to Schwarzman and to China in general take a step back and ask yourself I, I, I think being humble and asking yourself questions about what you don't know versus what you know and what you can add is a very good way of going about it um when you put your so everyone who comes to Schwarzman is incredibly um they're high performers you know everybody has a goal and everybody is so vibrant and alive and when you finish the program it takes you a while to adjust to quote unquote normal life because you're not being basically bombarded with inspiration 24 7. if you feel like you would thrive in an environment like that if you feel like you would thrive in building a community not taking away from it this is the program for you and if you feel like you can keep your mind open not just to learning but to the ability of being surprised if you're someone who shies away from surprise if you like the traditional and the comfortable this might not be for you and that's okay you know everybody is a person of their own building but 
if you're someone who enjoys being shocked and surprised and delighted, I think this is the place for you simply because delight is inbuilt into the experience. You can't escape it even if you tried. And yeah, yeah. that's ask yourself these questions and I think you'd be fine. Excellent. Thank you so much, Anna, for joining us. And Daniel, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Certainly. Um, so I'll try and be succinct around your, your question of what the next big thing is. Um, yeah, I can't forecast the future either, but, but certainly it seems to me one of the defining political questions of the 21st century, uh, not only is going to be, but already is, how China and the West, how China and the rest of the world uh, get along uh, internationally. And, and that is a uh, century defining question as, as it's going to play out. And there probably are very real areas of difference uh, and of, of competition or even of, of you know, direct antagonism between, between different uh, countries in that, in that context. And particularly given that fact, I think it's important that uh, lines of communication stay open. Uh, there is no more pressing or important time than, than now for young people from the US and from China to uh, get to know one another from the rest of the world as well. To, to engage, to, to debate, to discuss, uh, to build personal relationships uh, so that you know, this, this ongoing international uh, development is, is managed in a way that's, that's peaceful and, and productive and, uh, uh, and prosperous for, for, for everyone. So, so that's maybe one, one pitch there. Three short sentences on, on what advice I would have is, um, you know, don't disqualify yourself because you're not a China expert. I think we've, we've hammered home that point right now. Have an interest, but don't be a China hand necessarily. Don't view Schwartzman as purely an academic experience. It's, it's a much richer uh, program than that. It's uh, relationship building, it's traveling, it's uh, witnessing a place, it's sort of immersing yourself far beyond what kind of a, a narrow academic graduate degree, I think, might, might conjure up as an image. Uh, and then finally, don't think about it as an investment in the next job you want to have after you graduate or the next thing you want to do right the year after. Think of it as an investment in the rest of your life and, and in kind of the grand arc of, of where you're going to be uh, 30 or 40 years from now. And whether, whether you think China has some bearing on that, whether you think you know, relationships that you can build now will have some bearing on that. I think that is the, the lens through which you should, uh, you should think about the program. Great, thank you so much, Stefan. Thank you, and I'll also try to be brief because I, I, I just wanna echo uh, what has just been said before. Um, on the first part of the question, um, yeah, the size, speed, and scale of transformation in China is uh, happens uh, happens so quickly that uh, that is something that I was not particularly used to. So, for example, uh, personal vignettes, something that I've been working on, or a topic that I've been working on, is mobility, and there there is many many, many hyper trends such as autonomous mobility, connected mobility, shared, and last not, but not least, also electric mobility. And on all those four topics, China um, is really driving innovation forward. Uh, on then the second question uh, for future applicants, uh, I saw the application as an exercise in self-reflection uh, and talking to many scholars, that's also how they saw it. Take your time, think about uh, who you are, where you want to go and what steps uh, you do want to achieve in the near future, but also in the long-term future. Uh, and research about the program. There's a lot of information out there on the program uh, and that will really inform you uh, what your experience at Schwarzman College would be like. And also if this would be an experience that you would enjoy while you're there. Um, but as also previously mentioned, if this uh, could help you inform your learning and your growth um, for, for your life. Um, and that's how I saw it. And that's what really drove me to apply for the program. Great, thank you so much. And Adea? Final words? <laughs> yeah, I think Daniel and Stefan both kind of hit on a lot of the major points of the, the next big thing and in, in the role that China is going to play in the world. So I'll just hit on the application piece. <laughs> um, I think I get asked a lot. Um, and I've seen it float around in, in the questions that were asked today um, as well. 
what what's the admissions committee looking for and, and how do I stand out in the application and the thing that I tell people and will continue to tell people is there is no ideal Schwartzman scholar um, and so when you go into the application attempting to search for what the admission committee wants you're not going to be successful um, you should really focus on just showing the admissions committee who you are um, in, in these types of application processes, I think being able to convey what I'm passionate about, how that passion is now manifesting in what I do in the world and the impact that I want to have tells a much better narrative than I was a political science major and I interned on Capitol Hill and I ate lunch with the president five times. Like being able to show the things that make you stand out without being able to tell the story of how that impacts the world in a better way is, is fruitless. Um, and so uh, somebody mentioned the, the exercise in self-reflection, really spend some time to think through what it is that you know I want to be known for in the world, whether that's on a major global scale, whether that's on a local scale, what impact do I want to have? Um, and then how will this year in China influence how I carry out said impact? And I think if you, you kind of focus on those things versus how to impress an admissions committee, then you, one, hopefully will be much more successful, but even if your application cycle isn't successful, um, this go around, the fact that you've done these exercises, you've just learned so much more about yourself, even in the process of applying to a program like Schwartzman, um, which I think is a, a victory within itself. Thank you so much. I couldn't have uh, said it any better than what our panelists were able to convey today about being open to being surprised and delighted, thinking about it with respect to the arc of your career and professional development, understanding the size and scale of what China and its future impact will have, and ultimately to reflect and tell your story. Christian, I'll turn it over to you for some last words. Sure. All right. Thanks so much, uh, scholars. Your stories really make me feel uh, all the feels because I think it's it's working is, the, is what's often going on in my head. So I know that we weren't able to get to everyone's burning questions. So we do encourage you to reach out uh, to admissions at chorismanscholars.org. Our website is chock full of a lot of opportunities for you to sign up for office hours, application advising. We have more of the Spotlight series queued up for the summer. So please engage, engage, engage. Uh, of those who are on camera, we had only uh, sample size four of over 700 uh, different scholars who were selected. So there are a lot of stories out there. So find what really resonates with you because that's part of the thrust of putting together a good application. The China application is going to be closing within the next 24 hours, but the US global deadline is in September 21st of this year for a start date of August 2022 and recognize uh, where you sit within the ecosystem of change and where you are in your different spaces and places and uh, if it were if it were me I would love to have this entourage of excellence that you saw on the camera here today and it was such a pleasure to hear from all your stories so uh, we definitely want to center again the diversity which is the secret sauce of Shores and Scholars so thank you everyone and we'll end the webinar now take care bye now <laughs>